This week, we continue our investigation into the practical ways you can future-proof your home, making it more sustainable, cost-effective and comfortable in the years to come. I'll be sitting down with Ronnie Nunez. He's James Hardy's technical support officer and he's going to explain the benefits of installing sarking in your walls. He says it can reduce the need for bulk insulation and improve the thermal comfort of the home. And in Australian style, we'll be looking at a socially and environmentally sustainable multi-residential project by Bent Architecture. And in this week's What's Hot, Mark Jones will bring us number 10 of the Light Home Hot Design Blogs. I'm here today with Ronnie Nuez. He's the Technical Support Officer with James Hardy Australia. Thank you for being with us, Ronnie. Yeah, thank you. So we're talking today about adding sarking to the walls of your house to improve its thermal comfort. Can you just give us a, um, basically explain to us what is um, sarking exactly and what kind of benefits can it have? Well, it is basically a membrane, okay, that is going to protect your frame and the components. Um, it is very important because when you add insulation to a wall, for example, once it gets wet or once it's not protected, it's not going to achieve its, its performance and it's going to affect your thermal comfort in, in the house. Um, so it's something that is, is quite important. Um, and even though it's not a requirement, except for bushfire prone areas, which it is a requirement, um, it is very important to have it and it's going to add comfort and, and moisture safety to your house. Okay, great. And I guess, do the, do the requirements or the uh, necessity for sarking, does it differ from, um, do it differ throughout Australia in different climate zones? Um, it is, okay. There is, there is different principles. For example, uh, up north in, in Queensland, because it's so humid, um, the temperature, you, you really want to get a vapor permeable that is not so breathable, okay, so that the moisture doesn't go inside the frame. If you get something that is breathable, you might get like some moisture like build up behind the vapor permeable and it's going to affect your frame. If you get something that is non-breathable, then the moisture is going to still stick outside. So, you know, it won't affect your frame and insulation. Right. Okay. And what, what uh, in your opinion, is the prime candidate for, um, for installing sucking? Is it a, you know, a brick veneer home in Hobart or is it a, a lightweight home in Cairns? Okay. Um, Regardless of where you're building, you still need a sarking, okay? It is, it is very advantageous, okay? Um, both in, in roofs and walls, and I would advise it for any type of construction. Now, um, you're gonna have different, there's about six, seven different tests that they perform to um, sarking, which we actually like to call it a vapor permeable membrane. Um, just to uh, make a bit of a statement and a difference to what roof sarking is, okay? Because they can have different specifications to it. So what's the difference between roof sarking and wall sarking? Well, initially roof sarking, there's a lot of them that are non-breathable, okay? Um, and they don't let um, your frame or your house breathe. This can have an effect in terms of moisture buildup. So we like to call it vapor permeable membrane. Our recommendations are to have like a low or medium um, breathability to your membrane. And that's will, this will allow for the moisture to drain and at the same time any buildup to dry up. Okay, I think you may have just answered this, but I guess what are the key characteristics for, for a wall sucking that people should be looking for? Yeah, definitely a high water barrier, okay? When you look at the data sheets, you're gonna see all the results from the test that the standard requires. Okay, one of them is a water barrier and vapor barrier, which are key elements in your choice. Okay, um, there's a lot of vapor permeable membranes that have an unclassified water barrier. Um, this basically stands, that doesn't mean that it might be high, that just means that it doesn't really pass the test for a high water barrier. Um, when they started doing roof sarkings, for example, they started making punching holes in, in the wall and these are claimed to be breathable membranes, but yet they have an unclassified water barrier because they let water in. So you need to be careful with this and make sure that you have a breathable barrier, but with a high water barrier. Okay, great. So we know what to install. When it comes to the actual installation, um, in a renovation capacity, is this something that has a lot of challenges? N not really. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a wrap. 
technically, and you're gonna go uh, wrap it around your house and do staple it, staple it, or you can use plate nails, or you can use nail it to your frame. It's very simple to install. Um, as soon as you're overlapping two layers, say if you run out and you need to overlap them, just make sure you have an overlap of about 150 mil, and and it should be fine. And is this something that people can do themselves or they need to get a contractor in? Definitely, definitely. Um, what you always gotta bear in mind when you're installing the Sarkin is that this is now your moisture plane. You are creating your moisture plane. So anything to do like flashings or on your windows or abutments, you need to make sure that you're keeping that moisture plane. And I'll give you an example. If, if you're having the head of your window and you have a flashing on the head of your window, you need to overlap the sarking on top of that flashing to make sure that the water would drip in the flashing and then and then get out of the house right to make sure that it doesn't hit the flashing and go in behind between the flashing and the wall wrap and then you the moisture still getting in okay so i guess that's one of the potential pitfalls is there any other challenges um not really uh i mean you you still <coughs> get a protect or you're protecting your frame and, and creating your moisture plane so the challenges are making sure that your moisture is being directed to the right path and the right exit. So directed to your flashings. At the corners, make sure you protect the corners with still with like a metal flashing on top of the socket. Um, and this will ensure that you, you're adding another barrier to it. So um, the moisture will hit the flashing first before it hits the wall wrap. Great. Okay, and this is going to grab extra protection to the corners because it's an easier point of entry. Okay, so someone's chosen the correct product, they've installed it. Yep. What kind of improvements can they expect to see throughout the house? Well, they can add their more comfort to it. Okay, um, there's paper permeables that can create reflective capabilities as well from the sun. This will create extra um, thermal properties. So when they talk about R value, okay, in a wall. So this cavity is going to reflect heat and therefore this is going to be warmer in cold climates because it's going to retain the heat and it's going to be colder in, war in hotter climates. Okay, are you able to give us an indication of, of uh, what kind of R values you will increase the home by? Depends, depends on how much your reflective cavity it is, but you can add um, an improvement of 0.5 R value, which is, which is quite significant, especially with the current requirements of the BCA on, on R values. Yeah. Okay, so do you think adding sarking to, a, um, to the wall or to wrapping your house with sarking, is it going to um, play a key factor in eliminating the need for you know, mechanical heating and cooling? Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah, definitely. And it's going to reduce um, the requirement of your bulk insulation. So if you require a bulk insulation, for example, of 2.5 to be able to specify your wall, because say the R value requirement of the BCA is 3.0 in this case, um, then by having a reflective cavity, you might get away with a 2.0 insulation, which is going to reduce cost. Okay, and, so, just, and just on cost, Ronnie, can you give us an indication of of what people can be expected to pay when they wrap their, their whole house with, with yeah. sarking? Yeah, definitely. So sarking can cost about a dollar a square meter, okay? And it, it, there's so many sarkings in the market and that's what you gotta be aware of. Now, premium sarkings are those that um, allow a high water barrier, but it's still got some kind of breathability without punching holes in it, mm. okay? Um, this is gonna make the membrane uniform, it's gonna avoid any moisture buildup, um, and these ones can cost about 80 cents more per square meter, you know, maybe up to a dollar. But what you're adding to your house is significant. Um, the problem with the ones that punch holes is that they don't really act as a moisture barrier, okay? And the breathability is not the same. And the breathability of the breathable ones that have no holes can be up to four times more. All right, fantastic. Final question, Ronnie. Yeah. If, um, if I was a, a homeowner and not, not just an interviewer, yeah. what would you tell me to convince me to, that I need sake in my house? Okay, I would tell you that it will make your frame last longer, make your cladding perform better, okay, because you're protecting it against the moisture. Um, you're also protecting your insulation Okay, because once it gets wet, your insulation is not going to perform and your house is going to get 
very, very cold in cold climates and very, very hot in hot climates. So Hi Mark, so what's number 10 of the hot design blogs? This week we found designaddicts.com.au, uh, the blog you can go directly to at designaddicts.com.au forward slash platform. Uh, it's a brainchild of Richard Mizo, who's a Melbourne based uh, design addict obviously. He vlogs about everything from uh, interior design to architecture from Australia and around the world. This blog covers a plethora of amazing homes, but one that caught our eye recently was one in coastal Victoria. It's set on a rugged remote area of Australia, which is amazing to have a look at, so if it's well worth it, checking it out. On the interiors front of this blog, he has documented a transformation of a local Sydney gem. Uh, the client of this home allowed the interior designers to uh, have free reign um, and was able to use lots of bold colours and patterns with an amazing result. You can follow his blog uh, on Twitter as well at DA underscore platform. I'm here today with Paul Porjazowski. He's a director of Bent Architecture down in Melbourne. Thank you for being with us, Paul. No problem at all. Great. So we're here talking about the Living Places Suburban Revival Project, which is a, a culmination of an open design competition that was run by the Victorian government. Can you tell us, just describe the project to us, Paul. What, what was the brief and, and why do you think you guys you know, took, took this competition out? Um, the brief was to, to increase the density of um, an existing office housing site. So there were um, six sites that were sitting side by side uh, with dwellings on each. And so the competition was uh, to consolidate those six sites and to increase the density of the site in, a, in an environmentally and socially sustainable way. So come up with um, a, a housing, an environmentally sustainable housing model that could not only um, uh, work on that site but could also work on other sites within the within the area and, and sites of varying scales. So, so the, the project needed to have a grain that was suitable not only for the the six consolidated sites that were the subject competition, uh, but also uh, that could be used on duplex sites or others um, within the context. Okay, and, and when you say it needed to be sustainable, could you elaborate a little bit on, on the sustainable credentials of the, of the project and, and how lightweight, because I mean this is a lightweight project, and how lightweight materials played a, played a factor in that? Well, um, the, the sustainability or the that those, those initiatives uh, run right through from the uh, site layout and urban layout right down to the to individual um, um, technologies and techniques in constructing each dwelling. So we we started off with a, um, a solar responsive um, uh, framework on the site where all, all of the dwellings uh, laid out um, uh, in an east-west band that runs or a series of east-west bands that run across the site so that we maximise the northern edges of each dwelling and then also uh, maximise the exposure of private open space to northern sunlight as well. And so all of, all of the habitable rooms in the development are north-facing, so all every living, dining space, every bedroom uh, of every dwelling is um, facing north. And that obviously has a major impact on the performance of the dwelling. So it basically gives you a great head start when the overall layout of the site um, it, it works. Um, and then in terms of uh, the design of the individual dwellings, well, they um, contain a number of um, ESD top technologies. So we've got um, waffle pod floor slabs. We've got reverse brick veneer or block veneer in this particular case construction. So we've got uh, block work on the inside of the dwelling and we've got lightweight cladding on the exterior of the dwelling. Um, we use a combination of lightweight materials from um, um, the James Hardy, the Sky on Axon and Matrix products, so a combination of those products. Uh, also recycled black butt um, cladding and then and also some um, colour bond roofing and walling as well. So the exterior of the dwellings are all lightweight with block work on the interior. Um, we used um, thermally broken windows, uh, PV cells to generate electricity within each dwelling. We've got our, because space, external space is at a premium, we've got all of our rainwater tanks located within the floor slab. So we've got um, tanks uh, uh, used as void formers within our um, waffle pod slabs. And um, we also use um, recycled grey water on the site as well. So there are a range of technologies in addition to that um, solar responsive 
suburban framework, there's a, a range of technologies that inform each of the each of the dwellings. Perfect. Paul, thank you for your time. No problem at all.